Wilson's is a wonderful book. And we've actually got to chapter two. Oh, by the way, before I forget, you have these beautiful little pamphlets in your bulletins. These are for you to share with friends and loved ones and invite them to our services this Easter. We would like you to share those, uh, please. Uh, this morning we are talking about God's wrath on judgmentalism. Last week we talked about Paul sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. He begins his letter by saying what I just said through song. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation. Paul gives several reasons why he's not ashamed. First of all, the gospel releases the power of God to salvation. Second, the gospel reaches everyone who believes. And third, the gospel reveals the character of God. And there are two parts Paul talks about of the character of God. The first part is his righteousness. The second part is his wrath. And he begins with the second part first, telling us about God's wrath. Last week we talked about God's wrath on the immoral person. This morning we want to talk about God's wrath on the judgmental person. So I want to ask you to open with me to Romans chapter 2, starting with verse 1 uh, of Romans chapter 2. You therefore have no excuse you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere man or a mere person, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience? Not realizing that God's kindness should lead you to repentance. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But to those who are, are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. All those who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when the Gentiles, who do not have the law, do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. 
since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Their conscience is also bearing witness. And through and their thoughts and now def and even defending them. This will take place on the day when God judges men's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. Wow, what a message that Paul had for us in these verses. I want to ask you a question this morning. Why should we let God God's judgment is based on truth. Notice what it says in verse 1. You who pass judgment on somebody else, if you think that you have what it takes to consider yourself to be good and somebody else to be bad, you are passing judgment on somebody. It's, Paul says, you have no excuse. Why? You are condemning yourself. Have you ever pointed a finger at somebody? You know, physically pointed a finger? I'm pointing a finger at Dale right now. Mm -hmm. And you know what happens when I point a finger at Dale? I got three pointing back at me. Have you ever thought of that? And Paul says that when you pass judgment on somebody else, you are condemning yourself. Why? Because you do the same things. Well, I've never heard of it, but that's not right. I'm not doing the same things as those bad people are. You've got to be kidding. I mean, I'm an upstanding citizen of this here human town. And I, I think I'm a pretty good dude. Wait a minute. Guess what? The ground is level at the foot of the Amen. cross. Amen. Amen. All have sinned. There's not a person here, your pastor included. In fact, your pastor's probably at the head of the bunch. I'm a sinner. Sometimes I think mean thoughts. I wouldn't tell you, but I do. Sometimes I say words that I wish I could take back, but I can't. Sometimes I do things that I regret doing. I am a sinner, and for me as a sinner to judge somebody else is a foolish thing to do. Because I'm judging myself when I judge somebody else. Our judgment, Paul says, is two things, both inexcusable and it's also hypocritical. God's judgment is based on truth. It is against those who do evil. By the way, Jerry Randall, still on point number one. We made it through yet. Uh, so God's judgment is based on truth. And then he has in verse three and four uh, three questions for those who pass judgment on others. First, the first question he has is, do you think you will escape God's judgment? And I have news for you. None of us will escape God's judgment. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Tim. I thought Jesus took our judgment on the cross. Yes, he did. Everyone who is a born again Christian, guess what? We will still stand before the judgment seat of Christ for what we have done. And for those who have not received Christ, they will be judged for what they have done, and because they have not asked Jesus to save them, they will be condemned for their sin. We all will stand before God. 
one day. And do you think that you're going to escape God's judgment? The answer is, uh-uh, no. Nobody will escape God's judgment. Second question, do you show contempt for God's kindness? In other words, God is showing love to the whole world. And when you think that you are better than somebody else, or that you're, if you would excuse the word, gooder, I do good things. I'm right all the time. Then you are actually showing contempt for the kindness of God to sinners. Paul's coming down on this judgmentalism thing. Nobody escapes God's judgment. Nobody should show contempt for God's kindness. Do you not realize that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? God is kind to all people. God loves all people. And God is not kind because, well, he's going to compromise a little bit on what he is, his rules. You know, I'm going to compromise, so that's not the point at all. God's kindness is for a purpose. God's kindness to you is to lead you to the place where you see that God is right and you are wrong, and his kindness is to lead you to the place of repentance. That's when you're willing to say that you're sorry for your sins. I heard a story about a man and his friend who were wearing coats. And uh, he had a very, very nice coat. And the sun and the wind were having a discussion with each other about this man's coat. And they wanted to make a bet with each other this is uh, not in the Bible, okay? Uh, uh, they wanted to make a bet with each other about who could get this man to take his coat off. And the wind, the wind said to the sun, I will blow my hardest and see if I can get this man to take his coat off. So the wind blew and blew and blew. And the man grabbed this, the uh, sides of his coat and he went like this and his coat stayed on real tight. Then the sun smiled and the sun said, let me try. And the sun just beamed and it got hot. And the man took it off his coat all the Do you know what? The sun is an image of the kindness of our God. God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance, where we'll take off the old coat of that sin that we've been holding on to, and we'll repent of our sin and come to the loving Savior. The second point that uh, Paul makes is not only that God's judgment is based on truth, second, his God's God does not show favoritism. Look at verse 5. You are storing up wrath against yourself. Last week we found out that the immoral people of this world are actually experiencing the wrath of God right now. Presently. But this morning we find out that the wrath of God is not only right now, there is also a wrath to come in the future. And Paul says, you are storing up God's wrath against yourself. When? For a future day of God's wrath. Why? Because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart. You're holding on to your self-righteousness. You're holding on, Paul says, to what you think is your own goodness. 
and that you can be convinced that you're the best person in the West Side. But guess what? You can have a stubborn and an unrepentant heart. Do you know why? If I'm a good dude, I don't have to say sorry for anything because I'm a good dude. I don't have to repent. Are you kidding? I'm good. We're all good. No. Paul says you have a stubborn, unrepentant heart. And judgment, our, our own judgment, is tainted by our stubbornness and our lack of repentance. Verses 6 to 8 says that God will repay each one for what they have done. And I want you to notice he will give eternal life to those who persist in doing good. Anybody here able to persist in doing good? Let me see your hand. You're a bunch of people that are you're kind of like me. Either you're scared, scared to raise your hand, or you're just like me because every time I try to do what's good, I end up doing something wrong. Anybody else feel like that? And Paul says that God rewards the people who persist in doing good with eternal life. Well, I want eternal life, but I can't quite persist in doing good. There's a secret to it. We're going to find out later in Romans that when we have Jesus indwelling us, and we allow His Holy Spirit to take control of us, we can do good. Not in and of ourselves, but because of the indwelling Holy Spirit. I'm giving you a hint about what's coming up. But so, he says, He will give eternal life to those who persist in doing good, but He will give wrath and anger to those who reject the truth. By the way, did you know that Jesus said, I am the truth. And if you reject Jesus and you reject God's truth, then you will receive God's wrath and God's anger. There are eternal results in verse 9 and 10. Trouble for every human being who does evil. Well, that means we're all in trouble, doesn't it? He says, for the Jew first and then for the Gentile. Does that remind you of Chapter 1, verse 16. That there will be glory for who does good, for the Jew first and for the Gentile. And then he says, God does not show favoritism. We are talking about a church in Rome where there was a conflict between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. And the Gentile Christian says, We've been faithful in this church. We've served this church for a long time. And there was a time when you Jews got kicked out of Rome. And during that time, we kept the thing together. Therefore, we are the core, we are the pillar of the church. And then the Jewish people said, Yeah, but God has loved the Jews ever since Abraham's time. And you Gentiles were brought in later. So you guys are latecomers. And there was a clash between the Jew and the Gentile. And Paul said, it's time to put your dukes down. It's time to quit fighting. It's time to realize that both Jew and Gentile are loved by God. Both Jew and Gentile are accepted by God because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, and not for any other reason. What does that say to us today? Is there anybody in this world that you think you're better than? Somebody of another culture? <coughs> Somebody of another belief or, or way of thinking? It's time to get rid of that prejudice and to realize we are all under God's wrath. And we are all able to be recipients of God's mercy. God's mercy is for everyone. 
God does not show favoritism. So, why should we let God be the judge? First of all, His judgment is based on truth. Second of all, God does not show favoritism. And third, God can judge our secrets. Have you ever kept secrets from somebody? Have you ever kept secrets from somebody in charge? Have you ever kept secrets from your parents? There are some times that we as parents don't know everything about what's happened with our kids. Is that true? Or am I I'm the only one that's gone through that? <laughs> Sometimes Suzanne and Stephanie have been talking in their rooms before I ever got there. And all of a sudden there's a conflict and uh, I don't really know what's the base of the conflict because a lot has happened in secret. And Paul says there are people in our world who have all kinds of secrets. And I look at Paul and he looks like he's just a saint. I mean, he's got it all together. But guess what? God knows the secrets that are in Paul's heart and life that I don't know. Number one, that's why I can't judge Paul. Because I don't know enough. And number two, that's why God is the one to judge. Because he knows everybody's secrets. By the way, if you think you're holding a secret from Pastor Tim, you might be right. In fact, you might even be successful in holding a secret from Pastor Tim. There are people who have become members of this church and have held secrets back from me and I found out later. It's true. But you can't hold a secret from God. God's x-ray eyes see through all of your secrets. He knows your heart. He knows exactly who you are. Paul says that the Gentiles were not given the law. And he talks about them in verse 12. He says, all who sin apart from the law, people who have not, never received the law, all who sin apart from the law will perish apart from the law. In other words, you don't have to have a knowledge of the Ten Commandments in order to be guilty before God. Did you know that? You're guilty before God because of your conscience. Anybody here have a conscience? Anybody here have a conscience that tells you when you're doing wrong? And you know that you're doing wrong without even reading the Ten Commandments. And Paul says, Aha! That's a great example, Tim. Talk about it on Sunday morning. People know by their conscience that they're doing wrong without ever having read the Ten Commandments. And just because the Jewish people have the Ten Commandments, they are doubly guilty because they also have a conscience and they have the Ten Commandments that informs their conscience and all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. But in verse 13 to 15, Paul says, The Jews have heard the law, and it is not those who have just heard the law, it's those who obey the law. So I can say, guess what? I've been in church since I was knee high to a grasshopper, and that's a long time ago for me. I was in church the first Sunday after I was born, and I've missed very rarely since. I can say, hey, I know that I'm a good person because I go to church every Sunday. Shouldn't you pat me on the back? I know all about all these preachers and all the things. I can tell you sermons that I heard 40 years ago. The problem with that is, 
that every sermon that I heard and I remember, I'm accountable for. Ooh, that's a lot of sermons. And some of you say, well, that's where I'm good, Pastor Tim. I don't go to church that often. I've only gone to church for two weeks. So I am not accountable for very much. Ah, yes. God has put in you a conscience. And you're responsible for what, how God programmed your conscience. Oh, Pastor Tim, I know how to, how to go against my conscience. I know how, actually how to make my conscience die. So I'm free, right? No, you're responsible for what your conscience told you before it died, and you're responsible for making it die. In other words, oops, folks, we're all in trouble. The Jews have heard the law, but those who hear the law are not the ones who are saved, it's those who obey the law. And the Gentiles have not heard the law, but when they do what is required by their conscience, they prove that God is working in them to tell them what's right and wrong. In other words, we're all guilty. And because you're guilty and I'm guilty, it's a foolish thing to point our fingers at each other and say, you bad. Why? Because as much as I point my finger at Jimbo and say, you bad, he can say, you bad too, bro. <laughs> We're all bad. So let down all of your defenses and stop judging each other. That's what the Bible's saying here. Stop judging each other. Stop judging. Let me tell you a story. I went to a certain church. I won't even tell you the name of the church because I don't want this person to get upset at me. I went to a certain church and they were uh, listening to me preach in order to see whether they wanted to call me to be their pastor. And after church, this man wanted to come talk to me. And he came and talked to me and he said, Pastor Tim, are you going to preach against homosexuality? And I thought, boy, what an interesting question. And I said to him, I believe homosexuality is sin. But it's just as much sin to have sex outside of marriage. Mm -hmm. There are many other things. So I'm not out to point individual sins out as much as I'm saying we've all sinned before God and we all need to make our ourselves right through the payment of Jesus Christ on the cross. Mm -hmm. Oh, I never knew that. And you know what I found out within a few weeks? That man was supporting his daughter to live out of marriage with his with her with her boyfriend. And he wanted me to condemn somebody else's sin, but he wasn't willing to deal with the sin in his own family. That's the way people are. We like to point out that fog in somebody else's eye. We forget the speck in our own eye. And Paul says, quit it. Realize that God is wrath, God's wrath is against the judgmental person just as much as it's against the immoral person. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and how it speaks to us. We thank you that we know clearly that we are not supposed to judge each other. We know what your word is 
saying. We know what's truth and what's not truth. That we understand. But we're not supposed to judge people. We're supposed to leave that to you. Help us to do that in our daily lives. If you're here this morning and God's speaking to your heart, why don't you come forward and let me pray with you? No judgment. And when you see somebody come forward, don't judge them and say, oh, that person's really a sinner. They're walking forward. No. That person realizes they need a Savior, just like you. So this morning, as we give the invitation, whatever God's speaking to your heart about, you can come forward and you can pray. Maybe God wants you to become a Christian for the first time. Maybe God wants you to be baptized or join the church. Whatever God is speaking to your heart about, you come forward and you make it right with God. I will pray with you with my mic off, ready to talk to you, and ready to love on you, not to judge you. This is your time to respond to the Lord about what He said to you. Come to Jesus. Thank mm -hmm. you.